Hi folks, this is all the fruit and today I want to talk to you about a fruit which is not just beautiful and tasty but also has a huge cultural and historic significance for the region where I come from. It's the blue plum Prunus domestica subspecies domestica. Uh, as you can probably see I'm on my farm in Heidelberg. It's the first days of August. Lots of cherry plums, blue plums and other plums are ripe. The apples, most of them are still unripe, so it really is plum season right now. The farm is situated in the foothills of the low mountains or big hills around Heidelberg. This is a very typical place for fruit growing. If you try to grow fruit on the higher hills or mountains, what they did a couple hundred years ago, there it's too cold. If you try to do it in the valleys between those mountains, it's still too cold because the cold air from the mountains tends to flow down into the valleys between those mountains. If you are trying to grow fruit over there in the flat areas, well, it's still too cold, not in summer. The summers down there are horribly hot, sometimes, not always. But this cold air from the mountains flows down, especially in winter, and forms lakes of cold air over the plains. So basically, growing fruit is difficult everywhere. Nope, on the foothills of those hills, so, not on the hills, not in the valleys, not in the plains, but in the foothills. The climate is best. The summers are usually not as hot as in the plains, at least if you are on a northern slope. If you are on a southern slope like this here, they are hot. And the winters are milder than in the hills, milder than in the valleys, and milder than in the plains. Well, why am I telling you this? I'm not even from this area, but what I want to say is wine growing and fruit growing is concentrated in the foothills. Usually the wine is above the fruit because it is even more, the grapevine is even more uh, sensitive to cold than the fruit trees. But here we are pretty high and still we have fruit trees and not grapevines, so it, it's not a hundred percent like this. Well, the area where I come from in Bulgaria is on the northern foothills of the Balkan mountains. And we have lots of blue plums. You know, nowadays most fruit, well, most types of fruit, China is the biggest producer of pretty much all the temperate and subtropical fruit, or the US or Turkey. But the blue plums, despite being known pretty much everywhere in temperate to warm temperate areas around the globe are kind of a Balkan specialty. The biggest producer seems to be Serbia, but the area where I come from, in the northern foothills of the Balkans, are also quite famous for blue plums in Bulgaria. So, the blue plum was our most popular, was our favorite plum. Despite having tons of cherry plums, just like here in Germany, but nobody really appreciates the cherry plums, that's a pity. But the blue plum, it was our favorite plum, it was our staple food, it was even our currency. Well into the 20th century, well into socialism. This was our currency, folks, blue plums, at least one of our currencies, together with money and some other things. So, how do you use plums as currencies? Well, I told you that in the plains, often the winters are too cold for fruit trees. And especially in spring, you can have some pretty late frosts. So, my grandfather used to tell me that his grandfather and later his father, like in August, when they finished harvesting the wheat and the plums, every family would look 
at what they have harvested and the situation would be pretty much the same every year. Not enough wheat for everyone, but tons of plums. So what would they do? Every farmer from the foothills would load mm, one of those old-fashioned ox carts with two giant wheels with plums, put two oxen or black water buffalo in front of it and go into the plains. And there he would exchange the plums for wheat. He would go to a lot of those farms in the plains where the plum trees had their, their flowers frozen, their blossoms frozen in spring and would start giving them plums for wheat. Three buckets of plums for one bucket of wheat. Yeah, and then a couple days or weeks later he would return from the plains to the foothills with an ox cart considerably lighter because wheat is still more expensive, was still more expensive than blue plums. And in late autumn, if you still had a lot of blue plums and not enough wheat, you would do this trip again. But how? In late autumn, those will be rotten and shriveled up. Well, everyone, every farm in our area had a little house for drying plums, about the size of this little cottage down there. This is not a house for drying plums. In those little houses for drying plums, you would have a little chimney, and the rest of the house would consist basically of a chest of giant drawers. The houses were made of stone, that's important, with the roof made of stone, that's important. And all those giant drawers, they would have bottoms made of mesh. Well, in older times it was made of willow twigs, in more modern times they make it of chicken wire. So when the plums were ripe, you would take them. By the way, this is a pretty plum variety. The first plum variety was one of the more traditional ones for Bulgaria. This is rather one which is more typical here in Germany, together with the more elongated plums. But basically what you would do, you would split the plums in two, you would eject the seed, you would put them like this in those drawers in this little house. You would turn on the fire in the chimney and dry them for 36 hours. Sometimes if the summer was wet even for 72 hours. My grandfather built a house in a small town and the house in the village, he didn't mind that the house was becoming a ruin. But as long as he could walk to the village, he would always maintain his little drying house for plums, sometimes also for apples, mushrooms and other things. But it was basically built for plums. Because remember, those were our staple and our currency. Well, I already explained the currency part, but how can you live on plums? Look at this branch. I've been harvesting this broken branch for at least 10 days now and look there is still more plums than leaves in some parts because the other branches are kind of high so I was too lazy to put a ladder here but even this one little broken branch has hundreds of plums and some of them are still not completely ripe well how do you make a blue plum your staple it's a plum. You eat it fresh, then you dry it, then you have a prune. You could also make compote out of it, but we, or they back then didn't have so many glass jars to make compote or juice. Also, it's not so good to make cider. Well, of course, we made a lot of plum brandy, which is the typical brandy of Bulgaria and even more famous in Serbia. It's called Rakia in both countries. Okay, but brandy is still not a staple, so what do you do with those plums? Well, 
the prunes, you would put them in a lot of dishes. Every dish you make with rice or some dishes with cabbage or with meat, you put a few prunes in there. They make the dish sweet and sour and then in this more or less boring rice or bulgur or other cereal, you find those prunes which after being cooked with the dish are soft and sweet and wonderful. Also, in winter, each family would have a cauldron of fruit tea simmering on the oven or on the chimney. And the fruit tea was made of dried fruits, dried cherries, dried apples, dried pears, but most importantly, dried blue plums. Yeah. Well, of course, you could chew the prunes, but we preferred to make them into tea because then you have delicious, sweet and sour, fragrant fruit tea. And afterwards, you could eat the soft fruit from the tea instead of chewing on dry prunes all winter. And my town is still even making chocolate from plums. Well, basically, it's you take a lot of prunes and you mash them up and make them into a bar and call it chocolate. It's not chocolate, but it's the closest thing poor people a hundred years ago in the Balkan foothills could afford. So, yeah, this was quite a long video for a simple thing like the blue plum. But I really wanted to explain to you the most important traditional fruit tree of my area. Yeah, and I'm really glad I could do it on my farm with those masses of plums. I think I should finish harvesting this branch before it breaks off completely. So folks, stay tuned for a lot more fruit videos from the farms and gardens and orchards of Heidelberg. And don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe.